Father in heaven, we're thankful that you love us so very, very much. And Lord, we're thankful that you promised to bless us because we're here studying the book of Revelation. Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit tonight to guide us, give us light and understanding as we study these important prophecies. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's, we're, we will be using our overhead tonight, but mostly we're going to be using the posters on the wall that we uh, introduced last night and the night before. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. That might be. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 is probably the chapter that is uh, studied the most uh, in the book of Revelation. And someone was asking me this evening about uh, seminars, and I presented this seminar a lot. Uh, I think I've said several times I've been presenting Revelation for 30 years, and that's true. But this is the first time that I've really presented this seminar. This is brand new material. Uh, I've never done a seminar on the book of Revelation verse by verse like we're doing here. Uh, usually I present it topics several topics. And when I have done it several topics, I would not, I, I have never presented last night's subject about the French Revolution. And I don't know if you were looking around, but when I asked how many of you heard of the French Revolution, there was like six or seven of you that raised your hand. I mean, that's kind of the reason. Nobody's ever heard of those things, and so it's rather difficult in a public type seminar. But when you're doing verse by verse through the book, you've got to deal with it because it's there, right? So, I'm having fun, and I'm trying to watch your faces and see if you're having fun and being blessed, and I'm reading your answers to see if you're getting it, and uh, I'm enjoying it. So, uh, I don't think this will be the last time, but this is, this is, well, I should say this is almost the first time. This is, like I say, brand new, and I wrote this seminar with this seminar in mind, Having never done it, I was a little scared. And so I worked with the people at the jail. Uh, Ed Jordan's a friend of mine, and they would like to have people go down to the jail. And so John and I went to jail for about six weeks last spring. And, uh, and I presented this inside the jail to the inmates and got their reaction and went over the material and, and found a lot of mistakes. And uh, that was sort of a part of the preparation for this seminar here tonight. All right, Revelation chapter 13. Question number one. What did John see next? Now, next means after his, the vision of Revelation 12. Revelation 12, he saw the war in heaven from the time Lucifer rebelled clear till the end. Now he's doing another recapitulism. He's backing up, because he's been clear to the end. Now he's backing up and starting again, okay? Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his feet, and great authority. So let's write in the answer. He saw a beast, he saw a beast which had seven heads and ten horns. You see it's up here on the A-row. <laughs> Where's some more seats? Are we all out of seats? John's checking on some chairs. Oh, John's getting some more. And uh, we can, there's tables right through that door. Just grab another table and pull it in here. There's two right here. There's two right here. We got two folks that need it. And there's two right in front. All right. All right, so the answer is a beast which had seven heads and ten horns. The name of the beast is blasphemy. The name of the beast is blasphemy. It 
was a composite beast made of a leopard, a bear, a lion, and a dragon. So the answer is, the next thing he saw was a beast which had seven heads and ten horns. The name of the beast is blasphemy. It was a composite beast made of a leopard, a bear, a lion, and a dragon. And we're talking about this one right here. Now those of you that are way over there, if you can't see this during the break, maybe you ought to come over and really focus in on these pictures so that you'll know what we're talking about. But John saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Now, what does sea represent in Bible prophecy? Many, many people. All right, he saw a beast coming up out of many, many people, but it was a composite. It was made of a leopard, it had bear's feet, it had a lion's head, and the dragon gave it its power and seed and great authority. When you look back, here we have a lion, and a bear, and a leopard, and here's a dragon, and here's a dragon. We learned last night that this dragon represents Satan, who is the power behind all evil. We learned last night that each of these beasts represents an era of world history, an era of world history in which a particular power was the main power. During this era of history, the nation of Babylon was the main power. During this era of history, the nation of Persia was the main power. During this era of history, the nation of Greece was the main power. During this era of history, the nation of Rome was the main power. And so this is the next era of history after Rome. Now, hopefully we'll be able, you'll be able to tell me, what era is that? The Dark Ages. Okay, remember how the Dark Ages kept coming up over and over. This is the era of the Dark Ages, and this is the main power in the Dark Ages. I'm going to test your knowledge from what you've learned. What was the main power in the Dark Ages? The, church. the Christian Church. So this is a symbol of the Christian Church. Notice that it's a composite. It's made up of all of these things. And that tells you that during the Dark Ages, the Christian Church was ruling the world and borrowing from all of the pagan cultures that had gone before it. Okay? Now let's identify the symbols. A beast, or a beast, and we want to go back to Daniel, and that's Daniel chapter 7, verse 17 and 23. Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 23. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17 and 23. Remember last night or the night before I shared with you that the, the first four beasts come from Daniel and this is describing them, defining it. Daniel 7, 17. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Then verse 19 says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others. Okay, so the four beasts are four kings, it says. And then in verse 23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So it's, it's really more than the king himself. It's the kingdom. So the beast represents a king or a kingdom in Bible prophecy. So this is the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome, the kingdom of the Christian church. Okay? So a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom. Horns, Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. Back right where we were. Daniel 7 and verse 24. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So, horns as well as beasts represent kings or kingdoms. Okay, so horns and beasts represent the same thing. 
All right, then the next one is crowns. What does a crown represent? Go to 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 12. 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 12. Going back in history again. 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 12. And it says, And he brought forth the king's son, and put the crown upon him, and gave him the testimony, and they made him king, and anointed him, and they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. It made him the monarch when they put the crown on his head, didn't it? So a crown stands for a monarchy. That's a form of government. There's monarchy, there's dem uh, democracy, there's dictatorships, republicans. All right? A crown is a monarchy. And blasphemy. Go to Mark chapter 2, verse 7. To get the biblical definition of blasphemy. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. The, the Pharisees were uh, arguing against Jesus here. And this is the question. Jesus, well, let's look at what Jesus did. Chapter 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak? What? blasphemies who can forgive sins but God only you see the Pharisees did not believe that Jesus was God and Jesus said to this palsy man son your sins are forgiven and he said what a blasphemer that's blasphemy to say you can forgive sins only God can forgive sins the biblical definition of blasphemy is to claim to forgive sin. Now, the wider definition would be for a man to claim something which belongs to God. That would be the, the big definition. But the, the, the one that's pointed out here is for a man to claim to be able to forgive sins. When only God can forgive sins, that's blasphemy. Okay? So the answer is, a man claiming to forgive sins. All right. Now, the summary. The composite beast is a symbol of medieval Christianity. Or you could put Dark Ages Christianity if you can't spell medieval. But medieval is the name, the word that means Dark Ages. So the composite beast is a symbol of medieval Christianity. An era in history when religious forces, the church, religious forces, controlled the state. Okay, now, having gone through that, let's go back and look at verses 1 and 2 again. It says, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Beast, me, or sea, means lots and lots of people. So John is saying, in my vision... I was watching the masses of humanity. And out of the masses of humanity arose another political era. And this ruling power in this political era was borrowing from all of the powers in the past. And he had seven heads. Seven means completeness, right? That means he had control over all the heads of state in that area. And he had ten horns. Horns also represent kings. It's interesting to note in history that when the Roman Empire fell apart, it broke into ten pieces. There was the Franks and the Furuli and the Ostrogoths and the busy goss, and there was ten of them. It broke into ten pieces. So prophecy said this new power not only had seven heads,
yes, it ruled him, but it actually was carrying ten horns. It governed all of the nations that had once been this. And there were crowns on those horns, so those were monarchies. And it says, and his name on his head was the name of blasphemy. And blasphemy, according to the Bible, is when a man claims to forgive sin. And I've told you the story how in the Dark Ages, the church set itself up to forgive sins and even printed those documents and sold them so that we, we will forgive you for the sins that you're going to commit next week. It's a pretty good deal, right? Except that blasphemy. That is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And God doesn't forgive them in advance. That's presumption. Okay? So this is a symbol of the Christian church in the Dark Ages. Okay, now let's continue on in our outline. Question number two. What happened to the composite beast? Verse three. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So the answer is, its head was wounded. Later, it received healing. After healing, it was restored to power. So as John watched, this, this beast, this, this power, this kingdom, received a nearly fatal wound, a wound, a deadly wound in his head. But then as he watched, little time went by, and the wound was healed, and after it was healed, it was restored to power. All right, now let's identify the symbol, the head wound. Go clear back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Right there, after Adam and Eve had disobeyed in the Garden of Eden, God made a promise about which side would ultimately win. He said, verse 15, and I will put enmity, that means I will put constant fighting, I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. How many of you have ever had a heel bruise? I heard some groans. <laughs> those hurt, don't they? My son right now is suffering from one of those. He worked two 16-hour shifts back-to-back -back as a nurse, and they were those crazy shifts. He was on his feet, and now his heel just kills him. He can hardly stand on called it plantar fasciitis. We always call it a heel bruise. <laughs> Hurts like crazy, but do you think he'll die? No, he won't die. And so Jesus said here that Satan will inflict a heel wound on the woman and her followers. Satan will inflict a lot of pain on God's side. But the woman and the seed of the woman, the baby that's born from the woman that we studied last night, says, will bruise your head, Satan, means kill you. So uh, a head wound is symbolic of death or being killed. Okay? So this power symbolizing medieval Christianity, which was religion controlling the state. So John saw in vision that out of the masses of people in the, what we, in the known world would rise another power, which we know as medieval Christianity. And then, as he watched, medieval Christianity received a fatal wound. And we studied about that last night. That's why the French Revolution is in there. The French Revolution is one of those turning points in history. Before that time, there was the divine right of kings, and for 1,260 years, the church had ruled the world. But the French Revolution threw that off, and Napoleon Bonaparte said, there's no preacher going to tell me how to run my kingdom.
And that was a struggle between the church and the forces in France. And finally, Napoleon marched his armies against the church's armies. And there was a war between France and the church. France had been the, uh, the what's called in history the oldest child of the church. The eldest child of the church. And the eldest child of the church now turned on the church. And Napoleon marched his armies, and the church marched their armies, and there was a war. And Napoleon won. And Napoleon captured the big shot leaders of the church, and he put them in irons, and brought them to France, and locked them up in a prison in Avignon, France, and they all died in Napoleon's prison. He said, there ain't no preacher going to tell me how to run my country. And he made it stick. And Napoleon broke the power of the church. And the church didn't have that power anymore. Before then, the church did. Okay? Number verse number three. Verses four and five describe the era of the composite beast rule. This would be the Dark Ages. What was involved besides civil authority? Verse four. It says, And they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is likened to the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So besides civil authority, the thing that was involved was worship. See, this was a situation where, where the people actually worshipped their government. Now, you don't worship your government, I don't think. <laughs> right? But they did during the Dark Ages. And it was the worship thing that gave the church this incredible power. For instance, maybe some of you have heard the story about one of the kings of England. There was one of the kings of England who came along before Napoleon, and he didn't like taking orders from the, from the church. And uh, he wanted to do his own thing, and so he tried to rebel and go his own way. And so the church leaders sent out word to everybody in England, until your king straightens up, Nobody in England that dies is going to heaven. Now, I mean to tell you, that's putting on the pressure. And in the Dark Ages, they believed that. I mean, that was, they didn't have the Bible like we have the Bible, and they believed that, that whatever the church said, that's what God did. And they had church cemeteries. And the, the church said, all right, you people in England, until your king straightens up, nobody can be buried in the church cemetery. You've got to be buried out in the field somewhere. <coughs> you're going to hell. You're not going to heaven. You're not going to be in the church cemetery. Well, if you're a politician on the king's side, and you're 30 years old, and you're hale and hearty, you can say, no, 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 But if your baby just died, do you want your baby buried in the church cemetery, or do you want your baby buried out in the pasture somewhere? comes pretty close to home, doesn't it? And so the people of England put pressure on the king, and they said, King, we're not going to obey you. We're going to obey the church because we want to go to heaven. And poor old king of England, finally he had to make a trip to see the head, head honchos of the church and ask, oh, please forgive me and let me back in your graces. And they made him stand outside the door for a week in the snow just to prove that they were the hot shots. See, that's the kind of power they had, and it was based on worship. The church was using its spiritual power to command worship. Okay, number, or next. Uh, how, how long would the era last? Verse 5. And there was given in him a mouth speaking great things. That's pretty great when you go to tell kings what they can do, isn't it? And blasphemy. That's this power to forgive sin. And power was given unto him to continue how long? Forty-two months, which is how many years? One thousand two hundred and sixty, which we call the period of the Dark Ages. Okay. Question number four. What would the medieval church do while in power? Verse six and seven. 
And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them which dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So, the answer is, he would blaspheme God. We talked about that. Claim the power to forgive the people's sins. Claim the power, here's another one, claim the power to let them into heaven. I think it's God that decides who gets to heaven, don't you? Not the church. But here they, when that deal I told you about England, they weren't going to let anybody in England into heaven until the king straightened up. So they're blaspheming God and make war against God's saints. Blaspheme God and make war against God's saints. And then it says, who are saints? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Find who are the saints. Visions 1 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the who? To the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. He was writing this letter to the church members in Ephesus. So if you're a member of the Christian church, you are a saint time your wife gets mad at you guys, remind her that she's married to a saint. <laughs> because you're a member of the church, and that is a saint. And so the, the Bible says here that the church in medieval times would make war against the saints, and the saints are church members. That's what you're supposed to write in that blank. It would make war against its own members. I shared with you the other night that during this time, the church executed 60 million of its own members. You know, we talk about communism executing their own people in Russia, and the Chinese communists under the Cultural Revolution executing their own people, and the Khmer Rouge executing their own people, and we think, oh, how horrible. During the Dark Ages, the church executed 60 million of its own members. Some of the, the ones that stand out, there was a man named John Huss. And John Huss, way back in the 1300s, he felt like people ought to be able to read the Bible in their own tongue, and so he started trans could read Latin and Greek, and he started translating it into the common language. They burned him at the stake. How many of you have heard of Galileo? Hey, there's somebody we know. All right, Galileo was a member of the church, and Galileo invented the telescope. And, and Galileo studied with the telescope. He discovered that the earth goes around the sun. Well, for hundreds of years, the church had been teaching that the sun goes around the earth. And so when Galileo started teaching that the earth goes around the sun, the church arrested him had their police arrest him. And they were going to burn him at the stake. But he didn't have the courage that John Huss had. He said, okay, guys, if you want to believe it goes around, fine, have it that way. And so he, he confessed his sin. But history books say, you know, after they released him and he published his recantation, he, he said to the people he's walking out, but it does. <laughs> 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 that just... That's just the way it was, you see. Number five, how universal would be the power of the medieval church? Verse eight, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And so the answer is, over all except those written in the book of life. All except those written in the book of life. And who is written in the book of life? If we just turn ahead, just a few chapters in Revelation. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. This is where we'll be on next Monday night. <laughs> okay? We're going to jump ahead. Verse 27. Talking about who's going to be saved. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, 
but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So the ones that are written in the Lamb's book of life are those that don't lie, that don't do abominable things. In other words, those who walk the talk. That's what the answer. Those written in the book of life are those who walk the talk. Those who keep God's commandments. And even in those dark ages, there were people like John Huss and a guy named Jerome and a guy named Martin Luther and, and, and oh, you know, the list is really quite long that we know about. And, and I'm sure there were thousands of individual Christians, those 60 million that were, that were killed by the church. They were walking the talk. Yes. Chapter or number three. Oh, uh, where am I? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, how long would the era last? 42 months of prophetic time or 1260 years literal time. And that's 538 to 1798. 538 was when the Roman Empire fell apart and the emperor left. 1798 was when Napoleon put the leaders of the church in jail. Okay? Uh, okay, so those who walk the law, the talk. So during the Dark Ages, almost everybody was, was accepting the power of the medieval church. Number six, how would the era of the beast end? Verses 9 and 10. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the answer is, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed. And this is why we studied the French Revolution last night. See how this all fits together? For 1,260 years, the church had been killing everybody that didn't agree with it. The church had been putting thousands of people into captivity, into jail. And the prophecy says, he that leadeth into captivity will go into captivity. In 1798, Napoleon said, I've had it to hear, and Napoleon's armies won, and the leadership of the church ended up in jail and died there. And in France, that we talked about last night, 850 pastors were arrested and put in the galleys. You know what the galleys are, those ships that they had to row? They arrested the pastors, they put chains around their arms, they put chains around the oar, and they sat there and rowed that galley till they died. They couldn't even get up to go to the bathroom. They had to go to the bathroom right there on the bench. That's what they thought of pastors. They executed, um, they guillotined, about 10,000, and another 10,000 escaped from France, and another 20,000 abandoned Christianity and began to worship the uh, prostitute that I told you about last night. So the, the nation of France did to the church exactly what the church had been doing to people for 12,000, uh, I mean, 1,260 years. If you read history books about that time, Historians say things like this. The eldest child of the church had learned her lesson well and turned it back on the church. Number seven. How is the ruling power of the next era symbolized? Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up. See? Beast is, is eras of history and the power that's ruling. So now this is the next one. We've studied in history. The medieval Christianity ended, really, 1798. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So we want to write the answer. A beast coming up out of the earth, with two horns like a lamb. So it's a beast coming up out of the earth with two horns like a lamb. 
This is a symbol of the West. You understand what I mean by the West? We have the West, and we have the East, and we have the Third World. This is a symbol of the West, led by the United States. Now, it says, and, and this we're using this as a symbol of it. Okay, this is a, this is a beast. Now it says it comes up out of the earth. All of these came up out of the sea. We're not doing Daniel, so we haven't gone back and read the description. But every single one of them, the prophets saw them coming out of the sea. So this, this, this uh, political entity, the Babylonian era, arose in the fertile crescent of the Middle East where there was teeming millions of people. This also arose in, in Persia where there was teeming millions of people. This one arose in Greece, around the Mediterranean Sea, where there's teeming millions of people. This one, Rome, Italy, lots of people there. Christianity, all the way around the Mediterranean Sea, teeming millions of people. But now, John says, I saw another beast. I saw the next major era of history coming up out of the earth. Now, water represents lots and lots of people, and what did we learn that earth represents? sparse people. So this power would come up where there weren't very many people. And we, I told you the other night, this was a symbol of the West led by the United States. When the United States came into existence, there were relatively few people here. You know, a few million Indians in the whole continent. It was not the teeming vast population of the old world. Okay. Um, the two hornless crowns. Remember, we learned that the horns symbolize power, kingdoms, nations, and all the crowns we've seen so far have, all the horns we've seen so far have crowns on them. Suddenly, John sees a power coming into existence. It has two horns. There's two sources of authority, but there's no crown. And so, why don't you write down that blank? Democracy, democracy, and freedom of religion. Democracy, free state and a free church. You might want to put it that way. A free state and a free church. See, there's no crown on the president of the United States. We do not have a king, do we? No crown on our president. And the religion in America is free. In America, you can write your own religion if you want to. And even if you go to a church, can the church make you do anything? If you don't like the preacher, you're out of there, right? Happens to me all the time. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it. This is a free country, and we have free religion. So, and when you stop to think about it, the powers that make this country go, really, are politics and religion. It's always been that way. And there's no crown on either one of them. And land-like form. When you think of a lamb, don't you think of peace? Lambs have always been symbolic of peace. And so this would be a peaceful era, or a peaceful nation. And the symbolism of the bison, I think, fits real well. There used to be millions and millions of bisons out here in Colorado, they tell me. And a bison is a huge, big, powerful animal. I've read how they used to round them up and put them in boxcars, and the first time they did that, they didn't pay attention, and the old bison, he just kind of trotting along, and he dropped up into the boxcar, and he went right on through the other side and kept on going and never missed the beat. Huge, powerful animals. And then they had to reinforce the thing with four-by-fours to hold him in there. And he had these two little horns. But bisons don't bite their horns, really. They're not bitey animals. They're as split of good chewers. <laughs> okay? Uh, they just go together. So it, it's a good symbol. Now, in this verse, we move to the future. It says, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. As John was watching in vision, 
this peaceful animal, this peaceful nation, suddenly John is shocked. All of a sudden, he begins to speak like a dragon. We are living right now in the middle of that birth. The United States coming up out of the earth, that's happened. Developing two horns like a lamb, that has happened. But the United States is not speaking like a dragon. The United States is still a freedom-loving country. I am glad to be in the United States. Amen? But the prophecy is that at some point in the future, that will change. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. So if you want to just put a little mark in your Bible, we're living in verse 11, just before he begins to speak as a dragon. Number 8 says, What change would occur in the West? Verse 11 and 12. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth, that means makes the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So the answer is, what change would occur during the era of the West? It would speak like a dragon. It would exercise all the power of medieval Christianity. And who is the dragon? Satan is the dragon. So the prophecy says that the United States is going to experience a change. It's going to begin to speak like Satan. Does Satan love you and give you free choice? No, no he tries to force you. The, earth, the medieval Christian church was given its power by Satan. It tried to force people to do its thing. So there will come a time in the future when the United States will try to force people to, to follow religious things. It says it exercises all the power of the first beast before it. All right, there's several beasts before it, but the one right before it is this one, right? So according to the prophecy, a time is coming when the United States of America will exercise all the power that medieval Christianity exercised, where religion controls the state and laws are made about what you have to believe religiously. Number nine, what movement will originate in the West? Verse 13 and 14. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by the sword and did live. So if you can allow me to put up one of our overhead illustrations. Can you see here what's happening? The buffalo beast, the United States of America, is becoming a sculptor. See him sculpturing there? And he's carving out a statue. He's carving out an image of the beast. So it says that the United States of America will create an image of medieval Christianity. Now, medieval Christianity was not a statue. This is symbolism, remember. So the United States of America will foster and give rise to some kind of a religio-political conglomeration that's similar to this, where religious issues control the government. And so that's this. The image of the beast is the final era of Earth's history. This is the end. And the United States will be foremost in bringing into existence this new situation where government controls is controlled by religion. That's, that's the image. Some kind of a Religious organization that controls the government is the image to medieval Christianity. Is, is that clear? Are you following me there? Okay, that's what it's saying. The United States of America will create a religious situation that controls the government 
first here in the United States and eventually the whole world. So let's write down the answer. A miracle working religious force which controls civil government. So this movement will originate in the West here in the United States. Pastor, in verse 12 and 14 where it says, um, kind of exercise all the power of the first beast and cause the earth, is he talking about a partially populated area there? Um, actually, there, in the context there, he's talking about the whole world. He's talking about the whole world there. Okay, now remember, in the prophecy, when we started in the very beginning, it said that the that medieval Christianity, would, the beast, would receive a deadly wound. And it was killed in 1798. But then the prophecy said, but the wound would be healed. Now we're finding out how it's going to be healed, not precisely medieval Christianity, but the United States of America will create an image to it. We'll, we'll recreate it, if you will. So that once again, the church is controlling the government in all the world. Number uh, ten. What will eventually happen in the West? Verse 15. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak. Now, how does a political organization speak? It passes laws, right? The government has spoken when it passed a law. And cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Eventually, the United States of America will pass laws that if you don't follow the religious dictums of, of this new deal, you're going to be killed. That's exactly what happened in the Middle East, Dark Ages, isn't it? Sixty million of them were killed. Okay. Um, verse uh, 15, yeah. So the answer is, religious forces will gain such control that laws will be passed, making it a capital crime. Capital crime is one punishable by death. A capital crime to refuse to worship in the mandated way. So, according to the Bible, religious forces will gain such control that laws will be passed making it a capital crime to refuse to worship in the mandated way. That's exactly what happened in the Dark Ages. Question, now, down before, there below there it asks, has this happened before? What would you say? Yes. Oh, define worship. Okay, I'm sorry. See, I've got all my answers already written in and I forget where I'm at. <laughs> All right, define worship. This comes from Webster's Dictionary. So you can go home and check me out, okay? Go home and check me out. Worship is to perform an act of religious devotion. To perform an act of religious devotion. You haven't worshipped until you've performed an act. You know that act may be praying. Praying is an act, isn't it? The act may be going to church. That's an act. The act may be giving an offering. That's an act. Worship is to perform some act. So what the Bible is saying is that eventually in the United States, a law will be passed requiring certain religious acts. And if you refuse to do those acts, you will be killed. That's exactly what happened. Now, it says, has this happened before? I want to take you back in history. Daniel chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. Daniel chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. Daniel 3, 4, 5, and 6. Okay? Now, we're in, in this, here, we're in this era. 
Okay, this is back in this era. During the Babylonian era is when this story happened. Okay? It says, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, everybody, at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the harp, the sackbut, the falsery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship. That's an act, isn't it? To bow down. That's an act. Fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the burning fiery furnace. So Satan got such control of this era that finally the government passed a law that said, if you don't worship this idol, you're going to be killed. That's a violation of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? One of the commandments says, thou shalt not make it to be any graven image, and thou shalt not bow down thyself to work or serve them. So Satan, working through the government, said, you will disobey God's Ten Commandments or die. Right? Now let's go to the next one. Daniel chapter 6, verse 7. Daniel chapter 6, verse 7. And this happened during the time of the bear. This happened during the reign of Persia. Okay? Let's see, let's see what happened once again. 6, verse 7. All the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute, that's a law, to make a firm degree that whosoever shall ask a petition, that means whosoever prays, to any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So here, during the time of Persia, Satan got control of the government, and the government passed a law that says, if you pray to any god except Darius the king, you're going to be killed. Is that a violation of the Ten Commandments? The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so Satan, working through the Persian government, made a law that said to everybody, you will break the Ten Commandments, or you will die. Okay? So... The answer there is Daniel and the lion's den. That's the, and I didn't tell you the answer. The other one was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. That was the first answer. Okay. Now, the next one says 160 B.C. I can't give you a Bible text for this because the Bible, the Old Testament, the last part of the Old Testament was written in 500 B.C., and the first part of the New Testament wasn't written until 60 A.D. So no Bible was being written. I can tell you from history. I want you to write down in that blank, Antiochus Epiphanes. I think it's A-N-T-I-O-C-H-U-S. And then E-P-I-P-H-A-N-E-S. Don't hold me to that, but I think that's it. Antiochus Epiphanes. And Titus Epiphanes was a Greek king, and he marched into the church, the land of Israel, and he set up an idol to the Greek gods in the temple courts, and he said, you will sacrifice to that god, you will sacrifice a pig to that god, or you will die. Is that a violation of the Ten Commandments? That's two ways. Nowhere are they supposed to be sacrificing pigs. And you know how to, you know how he executed the people that refused? He took roasted pig and shoved it down their throat until he suffocated them. That's how he killed them. So here again we see that Satan got control of this country, and he said, You will break the Ten Commandments or you will die. Then the next one. 1313 A.D., I want you to write down Diocletian. D-I-O, Diocletian, something like that. This is, I'm a theologian, not a speller, okay? Anyway, he was a Roman emperor, and the Roman Empire was falling apart. Remember, this is 313. I've already taught you that the Roman Empire finally fell apart in 538. So, it's getting pretty serious. Diocletian made a law 
that said every single person in the empire has to go to the courthouse and offer a sacrifice to my picture. And the county clerk will give you a document that says you've done it. If you do not have that document in your possession, you will die. Is that a violation of the Ten Commandments? So in Rome, the devil got control of the country and said, you will disobey the Ten Commandments or you will die. And then the medieval times, the Dark Ages, just write down 60 million martyrs. I think we talked enough about that. They said, you will do this, and a lot of the stuff they wanted done was violation of the Bible. 60 million martyrs. Then Salem, Massachusetts, getting pretty close to home. Right down in that line, witch hunt. Even here in America, if you didn't worship the way they said you should worship, they killed you as a witch. Okay? And then it says North Africa. Did you know right now, right now, you think this is a civilized world we live in? Right now in North Africa, there are Christians who are being put to death by crucifixion. In the Muslim world over there, especially in the Sudan, there's a war going on, and the Muslims are telling the Christians that they have to convert to Islam, and if they catch Christian men, they crucify them. It's happening right now. You will worship our way, or you will die. I, so I, I spent a little time on this, because I know that you're sitting here in Greenland, and oh, that can't happen. It's happened all through history, and it's still happening. Number, the next is, what does the Bible say about history? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15. Ecclesiastes 3, 15. Ecclesiastes 3, 15. Ecclesiastes 3, 15 says, That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In other words, let's write it in. That which is to be hath already been. The modern way of saying that is history repeats itself. Okay? History repeats itself. I, some of you are probably watching the clock. If you are going to get your break, but this, this is one of those nights where this chapter is long and the next one's a little shorter, okay? Number 11. What act will be required of all by the United States? Verses 16 and 17 of Revelation 13. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. That covers everybody, doesn't it? He causes all, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. There it is, the mark of the beast. What act will be required of all? The mark of the beast. There is going to come a time when the United States will say, you will perform this act, or you will die. Now, given the fact that history shows that every time this has happened, this act has been a violation of the Ten Commandments, then it makes sense to assume that when it happens, whatever act this is, will be a disobedience to the Ten Commandments. Right? Okay. And if you don't do it, government will say you have to die. So this is the mark of the beast. This is an act which indicates acceptance of the authority of medieval Christianity. And notice it's the mark of the beast. This is the beast. Medieval Christianity is the beast. It's the United States which creates an image to the beast, but the United States and its images requires everybody to perform an act which is called the mark of the beast. 
So now we need to go back into medieval Christianity and ask ourselves, what was the mark of authority of medieval Christianity? I'm going to answer the question for you, then I'm going to explain it. So number 12, what act was the symbol of authority for medieval Christianity? The answer is Sunday, Sunday sacredness instead of Saturday. Sunday sacredness instead of Saturday. Now that probably comes as a surprise to a lot of you. So let me explain how it happened. Here we have a map of the medieval world. Medieval Christianity and the early church, really, all of this was the Christian church. And when the Christian church began, the first Christians were all ethnic Jews, weren't they? Every single one of them was Jewish. Which day do the Jews keep as a sacred day? Saturday. Okay. All the early Christians were ethnic Jews. They all kept the Ten Commandments. And the fourth commandment, which we've read, specifies that the seventh day is the Sabbath. So all the early Christians were Sabbath keepers. Then, in the year, around the year 100, yes, question? Yeah, what was the entrance of the North Africa? North Africa is uh, Christians crucified by Muslims. Okay, around the year 100, in the Roman Empire, around the Mediterranean Sea, there was a tremendously terrible anti-Semitic thing that happened, like Nazi Germany. And so the Romans just hated the Jews. And every time a Roman would see a Jew, he'd want to kill him. And the mobs of Romans just killed millions of Jews, and this is why Jerusalem got destroyed and everything. So it was really dangerous to be a Jew. Now think about it. The early Christians... Which Bible did they read? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. What Bible did the Jews read? The, Old the early Christians celebrated the resurrection of Jesus on the Sunday after what? Passover. Who celebrates Passover? The Jews. Read the New Testament and you'll find that the early Christians, the Apostle Paul, they always went to the Jewish synagogues to worship on Sabbath. In fact, the only difference between a Christian and a Jew in those first years was that Christians believed that Jesus of Nazareth is God, and Jews believed that Jesus of Nazareth is a fake. That was the only difference between Christians. Now, that's a mighty difference, but that was the only difference. And to a Roman soldier... That was a fine point of theology that escaped him altogether. <clears throat> and so a Roman soldier would see somebody reading that Old Testament scripture. He'd say, I hate those Jews. And he'd go to get him. And the guy would say, I'm not a Jew, I'm a Christian. It looks like a Jew, it smells like a Jew, I think you're a Jew. And he'd chop his head off. And so a lot of Christians got really persecuted because they thought they were Jews. And so the pastors of the Christian church said to their people, this is dangerous. We've got to establish a new identity for ourselves. We've got to make our religion look different than the Jewish religion. And so they set about doing that. They stopped going to Jewish synagogues to worship. And they worship in houses. You can read about that in the last part of the New Testament. And when they did build a church, it didn't look like a Jewish synagogue, it looked like a Roman basilica. And they changed the day that they celebrated Easter. They changed it from the day after Passover to the Roman feast of Ishtar. That's where we did Easter. Did it deliberately. We don't want to look like Jews. And they said, too dangerous to worship on Sabbath. Everybody stay home on Sabbath. Close the doors, close the curtains, and stay home and read your Bible. But you need to come to church, right? You have that, that. If you don't go to church, you lose out. All of you that are church people know that. And so the pastor said, look, stay home, keep the Sabbath at home.
But on Sunday, bring a big pot of food, and we'll get together and have a big dinner. And we'll invite the poor and the widows and the orphans. We'll invite them all to dinner. And then when the dinner's over, we'll send all the leftovers home with the poor people. And the Romans will, they'll know that's not Jewish. Right? Okay. That doesn't look Jewish, does it? And in conjunction with that dinner, we'll have a worship service. Now let me ask you, ever since you grew up, what dinner of the week was the biggest dinner? Sunday dinner. That's where it comes from. Sunday dinner. And so the Christian church very deliberately formed a new identity for itself. So in uh, 70 AD, all the Christians were Sabbath keepers. By 120 AD, around the Mediterranean Sea, all of the red area, Christians were going to church on Sunday. Now, they were still supposedly keeping Sabbath at home, but they were going to church on Sunday, except for a few down here in Africa and a very few up in the Alps. And you understand why they were going to church on Sunday, don't you? Well, after a few years, the thing with the Jews wore off. And then some Christians said, you know, we don't, we've, we've accomplished our deal. We don't look like Jews anymore. And it's true. The Jewish religion and the Christian religion today is obviously different, right? Okay. So now we need to, now we can go to church on Sabbath again, on Saturday. And some people said, oh, man, I'm used to this. Why do I have to change? Big argument in the church. Any of you that are church people ever seen an argument in church? Eh, not pretty, is it? Well, the argument in around the year 300 was, which day shall we go to church? Now, they all knew which day was the Sabbath, but the argument was, which day shall we go to church? <coughs> and so, by about 350 A.D., the world looked like this. Now you get uh, to the east, the green area, those folks were going to church on Saturday. Now, they were, they were going to church on Sunday, too. I need to tell you that. They were going both days in the east, but they were wanting to go back to Saturday. In the west, they were going to church on Sunday. And so now we have a power struggle. Have you ever seen a power struggle in church? Praise the Lord. And the power struggle was, which day do we go to church? Big political deal. And finally, around the year 320, they had a church council uh, over here in Laodicea. We, we studied that council. And they brought delegates in from all over the world to study this issue. And they studied it, studied it, argued, argued, and argued. Finally, the people from the West thought they had the votes to win. And so they made a motion. Guy stood up. I make a motion that we transfer the sacredness of the Sabbath from Saturday the seventh day of the week to Sunday the first day of the week. Somebody else jumped up and said, Second! Now you got a vote on it, right? And when the votes were counted, Sunday won. So the people in the West said, That settles it. Majority rules. People in the East said, No, it don't. You can't vote to change the Ten Commandments. It didn't settle anything. So the, the, the fight went on. But then, you remember we studied about the trumpets. Is that the way that the church is supposed to be doing? Is fighting each other? No. And God punished the church for its sins. Remember the trumpets? The invasion of Islam. Islam came up from the deserts and made that pincher movement around the Mediterranean Sea up to Poitiers and Kosovo. <laughs> And the devil was behind that. And the devil did his best to see that the Islam forces overran the part of Christianity that was keeping the Sabbath. Even though those that were really keeping the Sabbath, Islam respected that they didn't pay double taxes. And they weren't solid enough in the Lord to stay with it. The love of money is the root of all evil. 
And so Islam overran Sabbath teaching Christianity. And by medieval times, this is what you had. The red areas, they were going to church on Sunday and in fact keeping Sunday. They had transferred the sacredness from Saturday to Sunday. The brown is Islam. And to the best of our knowledge, the only Sabbath keepers were the Waldensian people up in the mountains of the Alps. And so the, the, the church, this is the Dark Ages church, they were fighting Islam, and they had this mentality, everybody's got to do it our way. And the reason that the church finally exterminated the Waldensians was because they wouldn't give up Saturday worship. You will go to Sunday, you will break the Ten Commandments, or you will die. Okay? And that was the mark that, of authority. So Sunday sacredness was the mark of authority of medieval church. And if you want to go to a religious library and wade through all the dusty tomes, you can still read it for yourself. Uh, in this day of ecumenical political correctness, it's not printed in, in modern books. But if you find a book written before 1950, it'll be laid right out there just as I shared it with you tonight. Since 1950, not political correct, so everybody teaches futurism. You will not hear this in futurism. Okay, so the act is Sunday sacredness. Number next, what was the numerical value of the name of the man at the head of medieval Christianity? It says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. I don't think this is super, super important, but the Bible mentions it, and we're going verse by verse, so we have to deal with it. It says it's the number of his name. I want to explain this to you. Here's my name, John Richard Martin. My name has a numerical value. If you write my name in Latin, or Greek for that matter, write it in Latin, which you're familiar with, which is Roman numeral. You know that Roman numerals have a value. A J is a 1, O has no value, an H is 200, N is 90, so the numerical value of John is 291. Richard is 801, Martin is 1251, add those up, so the numerical value of my name is 2,343. So I'm not the beast. <laughs> Some people think I'm the beast, but I'm not the beast. <laughs> You might want to figure out the numerical value of your name. It says the numerical value of the, the man at the top, the king, the leader of the, of the medieval church would be 666. The medieval church used the title Vicaria Filii Dei for its leader. And that's blasphemy. Vicaria Filii Dei means in place of, that's what vicarious means, in place of the Son of God. That, I told you, that's what the church was. We make the rules, we speak for God, etc., etc. And so if you take vicarious Philae Dei, and you add it up, the numerical value of vicarious is 112, uh, Philae is 53, and Dei is 500, and you add those up, and it comes to 6. Now, you need to know that there's a lot of names that come to 666. I understand that Henry Kissinger comes to 666. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's coincidence. But the Bible's just giving you one more little thing that verifies that the historical, the recapitulistic, historic explanation of Bible prophecy is, is accurate because it all checks out. So, before I let you go on the break, think about this. In the Bible, in Revelation 13, it predicted that the Christian church would take over the political control of the world. And did it? Yes, it did. Revelation 13 predicted that the power of the church would be broken. Was it? Yes, by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1798. 
Revelation 13 predicted that a new world power would come up from a very sparsely populated area. Did it? Yes, yes it did, the United States of America. Now, Revelation 13 predicts that before Jesus comes, religious forces will take over the United States of America and the West, and they will create a political situation that's similar to the Dark Ages, and in some way it will come about that a law is passed that you have to go to church on Sunday or you'll be executed. Most people will probably say, yeah, that's a good idea. But the Ten Commandments says the seventh day is the Sabbath. And to make a law that you have to worship the first day and work on the seventh day is to make a law that you have to break God's Ten Commandments. Just like always happens, it will happen one more time. Those who insist on obeying God's commandments during that time will be sentenced to death. And those who honor Sunday will receive the mark of the beast. But God will take charge. In the days of Daniel, God shut the lion's mouth. In the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God delivered them from the fiery furnace. God will deliver his people in the final day. Amen. Now, let me make one thing clear, and then I'm going to let you go. Many people today keep Sunday. That's wrong, but it may not be a sin. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if somebody's keeping Sunday and they don't know what you just learned, it's not a sin. It's wrong, but it's not a sin. But for some reason, God has brought you to this seminar. I don't know all the things that God did to bring you to this seminar, but now you know, don't you? Now you know. Now if you refuse to obey God's commandments to keep the Sabbath, you sinning because you are no longer able to I want you to know that there's at least 300 different Sabbath-keeping denominations.